Uh, let's uh, go to our next uh, speaker, Francois Van Heerden. He'll talk to us about uh, the Astro Video Learning Curve uh, fine-tuning settings to get results. Go ahead, Francois. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, hello, everyone. Just to let you know, I am actually in Trenton, Ontario, where Canada's largest Air Force base is. And to get us started, I'm going to start with a caveat. The number one thing I want to say is Astro Video is not the same as CCD imaging. Please be aware of that. If you're using a CCD camera, Astro Video is a completely different. You're in near real time imaging with this. So I use the Mallencam DS10C and the Mallencam Sky software. It's a 10 megapixel sensor. I also have a number of other cameras there, including the Exterminator, which is a true CCD camera and uses Astro Video Capture, like a video capture device and then MCAP or some other software to grab the image. But I'm going to focus tonight on the Mallencam Sky software. So this is the interface, pretty cluttered. And you'll notice at the moment, there's no device on the list there, but it has a whole bunch of settings that you can work with. And I'm going to look at what you need to do if you have a Mallencam or a similar Astro Video camera to start getting the best out of your software and to get the best images possible. So I'm going to look at these specific settings that I use for gain, my exposure time, white balance, digital binning, the histogram, dark field correction, and flat field correction, and then live stacking. And I want to especially focus on the dark field correction and flat field correction, because it's not the same as post-processing with a dark field or a flat field. So I want you to be aware of that. You can save the basic presets. So I actually save presets based on the type of object, filter combination, and camera that I'm using. And I can reload these into the Mallencam Sky software. It currently misses the ability to actually say, I'm going to take 30 seconds. So I have to go in and say how long I'm actually acquiring it for, for saving the images, because I can save live. It can literally just say, okay, it hits 30 seconds, it's going to save an image. Next 30 seconds, save the next image, and I use those for post-processing. So it works really effectively in that way. So my starting settings, I always start in video mode, and I set my gain between 20. It goes, the gain actually goes from zero to 160. I generally set it between 20 and 40. My capture resolution is there, 3,704 uh, 3, by 2778 pixels. And I can go anywhere from 100 milliseconds to five seconds. So this is ideal for planetary. If I'm doing planetary work or I'm going after the moon, at the moon, full moon, 100 milliseconds, and I'm almost blowing out my image. But I'm looking at deep sky. That's where the fun really begins. So that means I have to switch from the video mode to trigger mode. And my exposure time I set for looping. 30 seconds, but it can be anywhere from 100 milliseconds to hours. It's great. I then select my bit depth as 14 bits. And then I start to select for white balance. And here's where the fun begins, because you want to set that little box in the smallest area you can in the darkest area of the field of view. And that means I put mine off way off in the corner somewhere where I get the darkest part. <clears throat> My digital binning, I mostly work at one by one additive or two by two additive, and I'll go into that in a few moments. My histogram settings, I generally stay for my deep sky objects between 25 and 150, and this actually saves you time in post-processing. If you're doing stacking afterwards and deep sky stacker, and you're then going to adjust your histogram settings in Photoshop or Pixel, uh, PixInsight or whichever one of those other tools you're going to use. And then my live dark field correction. If I start with a 30 second image, I'm going to set my dark field correction that I select at 30 seconds and I'll use, then use the one by one or two by two additive. And I'll say you're gonna use a maximum of five dark field corrections. The same with the flat field. 
and then I live stack 40 frames in average mode for deep sky objects. So let's take a look at how this actually works. I capture the images and once I have, I'm in trigger mode and I've set all my settings, I hit F7 to start capturing the images that are saved to the hard drive in my observatory on the note, the little mini PC that I have in there. So I immediately start by setting my preferences. And this is where I was referring to the auto capture. I can select my file type that I want to save as. I can save as TIFF, PNG, you name it. There's a whole set in there. But here's the problem, where it's the time slot for how frequently it's going to capture a frame. I need to set that every single time to 30 seconds. Once I have that, I'm set to go. And I'm going to actually show you what I was doing with M51 so that you can see the actual results of how I set the, and what's going on. So here's where the learning curve begins and your fine tuning capabilities. So a critical tip for you, whatever deep sky object you're going for, reset your white balance every single time. I also do it for planetary because it's going to be with different lighting in the vicinity and the background when I'm actually pointing in different sections of the sky, especially since I'm in Trenton's light dome, this is a critical tip. I need to do my white balance every single time. Secondly, you must select the binning parameter, additive or average, and it has to match what you also put for your dark frame correction and your flat frame correction. Those two critical tips make your life so much simpler and easier. So dark frame is actually, and the flat frame is actually not done in post-processing. It's done live and is applied to each frame as it is captured in the camera as I'm stacking them inside the camera. And I'm stacking 40. And so this is going to remove any of the anomalies, the hot pixels and the dust bunnies from each frame. What does it look like? Well, let's have a look in a couple of seconds. I captured my flat frames at uh, twilight, the shortest flat against the sky that shows the dust bunnies. I save it and I just use five of them every time. I do them for additive and average for every time frame except for the flat frame. That I only want to do for that very short period. So this is the very first image I grab of M51, and you can see here, right now, I have not set my uh, histogram. I have not set my flat frame, <clears throat> haven't applied it. So I actually import it. I then enable it. And prior to doing that flat, you can see in a couple of little areas, there are some dust bunnies. One is particularly apparent right in here. I then take the next one. And if I select the appropriate dark frame, again, this is for the same length of time as I'm actually collecting and looping my image capture. So I made multiple dark frames for multiple temperature ranges. For, for winter, I have them much colder. Summer, I have them, and I can reuse these. This is great. As long as I'm using almost the exact same imaging train, it works. So that is one of the things I learned from my other colleagues that work in Malin cams, and it makes a huge, huge difference. So then you enable the dark frame and you will then start to see. So I have my dark field correction. I have my flat field correction. And then this is what starts to happen when I start. I can adjust my histogram on the fly. This is one of the best things you can do. You can thus adjust for the image darkness, the contrast. You can even go into your color selection and get it still better if you want to adjust your dynamic range for your image. And it'll bring out additional detail in near real time. So you can see here, I have a very noisy image of M51, but I'm starting to get more of the detail in the arms as I'm stacking. And when I enable the dark field and the flat field, so here I was adjusting the histogram. You can see it's at 25 and 150. And now I finally go to the live stacking. And this is where you start to see 
the changes that are starting to come here. Now, if your polar alignment is perfect and guiding is excellent, you can use additive stacking, but I prefer to use average. And then I can set the number of frames that I wanted to collect. So here we go. You can see there the live stack over here. I align the frames and I select average and I select deep sky. If I have a very bright object that's in the field, I can go to planetary if I'm running into a small problem that may occur. And that problem is if there's insufficient stars for Mellencamp sky to see surrounding the deep sky object, it'll lose track of where it is and you'll end up with the Pink Floyd effect, which is lines going off, streaks going off in every direction. And it's absolutely phenomenal, but it's a killer. So that frame is lost you then have to reverse the process and then reinitiate and start it again. And then you may have to change. So we still have a grainy, horrible image. So I'm going to show you now what happens when you're average stacking and this frame shows it. You'll notice that the frame is now somewhat darker. The arms, I'm starting to see detail in the arms. I'm getting the sweep of the arms, the detail, the clumps of stars in the arms, and it's really starting to show the difference. And then I get this. This is at binning two by two, and it was uh, additive. I did 10, 30 second frames in deep sky, and I ended up with slight adjustments. And that was my final image that I grabbed. Still not perfect. I have a number of things that I'm still working on to improve my abilities, but it shows you in near real time, you are getting so much of the detail. now. I should also mention that when I am doing this, I actually do it out in the field with outreach. And I can actually get these images without going to post-processing and project it on a screen for my audience. And I will get anywhere from 20 to 200 people in an audience when I'm out in the provincial parks. And I'm presenting them images that are like that. And I can actually then pick a region of interest and just project that part. So it really is one of the incredible advantages of Astro Video is you really get this incredible, powerful tool for outreach. So let's go the step further. That's where I was speaking of the problems with the matching algorithm in stacking, that you get the Pink Floyd a step effect. So then you have to stop stacking, stop looping, move to video mode, increase the gain to get more stars, then go back into trigger mode, start looping, and start live stacking. I, I should mention here that if you are capturing frames, stop the capture there, then stop the looping. And you also have to stop your, your uh, live stack. So you really have to work out back and forth which way you're going. So why white balance? Let me show you this on NGC 2903, which is in Leo. It's just off the head of Leo. So this was the very first frame that I took. Uh, I, you can see there, I'm in the light dome and I'm getting images. I'm not using a uh, basically a light shield on my or a dew shield on my scope in my observatory. But once I invoked light, the white balance, that was the difference. And the object became much more apparent very quickly. By the way, these are each individual 30 second frames, non stacked, exactly as it came from the telescope and the camera. It was just this image on the screen. No post-processing, no adjustments have been done on it. The 40th frame, you can see I got a lot more detail on it. So this really starts to show you here. You can see the arms and you can see the effect of the stacking because I'm not perfectly polar aligned. If you look around the border, you will see that the frames that are stacked, there's a little bit of black on each of those because it's picking the key stars and it's doing what it needs to with those. That was the final image after I basically was saying, okay, I want to get this. So that's the first frame is on the left. 
the 40th frame is on the right. And it gives you a clear indication of how much detail you can pull out in live stacking. So with slight post-processing, that was my final result. Of course, I then cropped it ultimately to get this. And it was 20 minutes of data, five minutes post-processing, and that's the image I got as the final. So when you are actually manipulating in real time, one of the things you can do, how many of you would love to get an object such as the Orion Nebula without having the core blown out, still being able to get the trapezium and then the beautiful sweep of that gorgeous cloud of gas. When you're working with a Malincam and Malincam sky, you can actually do high dynamic range images and it will absolutely work. I haven't got that. I'm not an expert at that. I'm still learning. So one of my colleagues is working with me to improve it. But the Leo triplet that was uh, what Blake just mentioned there that you can get, that's the first frame that I got after setting all of my parameters. Again, 30 seconds. And here is the 20th frame from live stacking. And that's something that I would be able to project for my audience without any difficulty. Post-processed, this was my Leo triplet with the hamburger galaxy. And you could see my white uh, or my flat isn't working correctly. So I need to do, uh, in case you're wondering why I have this horrible white disc in the middle of my images, it's because I'm not far enough away from the focal reducer. I didn't have a caliper set that I could work with. That's something I'm addressing. I needed to get an, an additional 20 millimeter extension tube, and then that will all go away. So the first and final live frame of the Crab Nebula, here is the first, and that was the final, stacking 10 frames and doing just some slight histogram adjustments. This was before I realized my focus was pretty bad. So I went and refocused and I got 20 minutes of data. So 30 by 40 seconds or 30 seconds, 40 frames. And it's not APOD worthy, but imagine being able to share this with family, friends, or when you're doing outreach. And with slight post-processing, I ended up with that, where you are actually starting to see some of the filamentary detail inside there. And this was after I refocused the telescope. Uh, I'm still working on some of that, but it's working nicely and I'm getting better at it. That is an expanded version of it so that you can actually see the detail I'm pulling out in live astro video. And I'm starting to get the star colors. So I'm not doing what people do with a dedicated CCD camera or a dedicated CMOS camera like an Attic or any one of those ZWO. This is live video. So I want to distinguish between that because if I went to those cameras, yeah, I'm going to get the same thing that Ron Brescher gets and a bunch of the other guys that are really advanced astrophotographers. So one of the things that's nice to get the high dynamic range capability in near real time is you start gathering the image data with specific settings. You pause the looping. You're not losing the data in the camera. So you stop the acquisition temporarily. You change the histogram. You can also change the gain. You can change the white balance. You can change any one of those other settings to get the high dynamic range capability. Then just start looping again, and it's going to continue to stack on the previously stacked images and frames that you had acquired. So you will get the very faint detail out to the edge while keeping faint detail in the center. One of the big advantages of this. Here are images that I have taken. To give you an example of what I get with the equipment I'm using right now, recognizing that I still have a problem with the distance from my focal reducer down to the camera sensor. 
but the Lagoon Nebula, you know, star clusters M13 shows up beautifully. This being the Eagle, M27, M57, M51. Really incredible, incredible detail in 10 minutes or less. And this is what I'm getting, the quality. One of the things I'm going to work on is the region of interest because I've just gone to a hyperstar, just arrived today as a matter of fact. So tonight will be my first chance to actually attempt work with it. I can actually focus on a very small area and that becomes the region of interest and I will only gather the data from that specific area. And I can adjust the frame size when grabbing video of planets to save space if I'm actually recording the video which I do locally on the hard drive and doing region of interest is going to save my hard drive capacity. So my primary targets coming this summer are going to be, of course, the deep sky objects, M31, definitely objects in Cygnus, such as the North American Nebula, the Pelican Nebula, the Veil, both East and West, but all in the same field of view, if, if it's possible, it should be. And I'll be experimenting extensively with the high dynamic range. So I will come back at a future meeting to give you a report on how well that has worked. And that brings me to the end. Are there any questions? Well, thank you very much, uh, Francois. Excellent presentation. Thank you for sharing uh, the possibilities with Astro Video. That's, that's impressive. Um, I know there are some questions. Uh, let's... Go to Ward. All right, great. Uh, yeah, we've got some questions here. Uh, Steve Van uh, would said, uh, would you say astro video is the same thing as electric electronically assisted astronomy, or is that something different? They are in in fact the same. Anything, okay, electronically assisted astronomy is anything that uses a camera and not the eye. That's the broad definition. What I'm doing with astro video definitely falls in the EAA category. Absolutely. Gotcha. Okay, great. Um, uh, Blake Mancaro uh, from Backstage, uh, actually on YouTube, uh, wants to know what are the price ranges for the Malin cams currently? Okay, so <laughs> they are starting with the DS-287-3, uh, 287C or monochrome are basically 300 bucks US. The DS-2.3 plus is $900 US. The DS-10C, which I have, is about $1,200 US. The DS-10C uh, tech adds an additional 100 or so to it. The DS16C uh, tech, which so thermoelectric cooling, so you won't have any of the amp glow and other issues that I have. That one goes for about 1600 US. And then the latest, the DS24C tech is uh, about 2300 bucks US. But if you contact uh, Rock Mallon directly, you can usually get a better price. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. And and he also mentioned uh, another question about the AMPLO, but I think you pretty much covered that with, with that mention. Um, Eric wants to know, uh, how is how is your Hyperstar? I don't know. I <laughs> only installed it today. I, it only came from Starizona and arrived on my doorstep at uh, 1300 hours today, roughly. So I've never used it yet. So I've installed it. I have to focus. And I understand that there might be slight collimation requirements. One of the things that uh, Starizona puts in their documentation, you must be very careful because there might be a slight angle on the primary mirror of your SCT. And so there's a couple of, there's two, there's three sets of two uh, adjustment points on the the uh, hyperstar itself and i have to check that tonight if my stars are not perfectly round 
I gotcha. Okay. So a little bit of work to do. Yes. Um, can, as Steve asks, uh, can the Mellon, Mellon Cam Sky software be used with other manufacturing, uh, other manufacturers' devices? Uh, and is would ASCOM be required for that? You can use it for some, but I haven't heard of anyone having great success with it. My comment would be you can go onto Rock's website, download it, and give it a test. You can hook it up with ASCOM. So that's definitely one of the aspects. He's got the ASCOM drivers on his website under the uh, support and then software. Great. Uh, and one last question that I see here from uh, Lewis Rifkin. How many cameras do you use? Okay, I have the uh, two Exterminator A's, which is the fastest CCD cameras I've got. I have the DS-287C for extremely faint objects. It's only 280K pixels. I have the DS-10C. I have the Malencam Universe, which is a full frame CCD camera. And then I have the HD 10, which is for planetary and lunar. So I use all of them. Excellent. I don't see any more questions online. Thanks very much, Francois. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks, Francois. And uh, we'll take you up on your offer to come back and uh, give us an update on your imaging.